Okay, my clock says 3 p.m. So uh, let me give you a warm welcome. I mean, to all the participants of the Leipzig lecture series on language 2021, triple L we could say. So the Leipzig lectures on language 2021 is a novel series of online talks on combinatorics in language. In this series, we will discuss visions in theoretical, and experimental linguistics in combination with cutting edge empirical methods. And I think this is, this is important. So the lecture series on language aims to not just capture the current states of the field, but seeks to highlight the directions into which junior scholars are currently moving forward and thereby frame the future of the field. From May to September 2021, there will be nine sessions altogether. Every session will provide a platform for a so-called tandem. Um, that is a tandem of a senior and a junior scientist who will discuss questions concerning combinatorics in language. A full list of these lectures will be seen later, and it's also available on the webpage. In every of these sessions, a junior researcher will first briefly, a senior researcher, I should say, will briefly first introduce the prominent aspects of their theoretical framework related to combinatorics and language. And then the junior research will give a detailed talk on their empirical work. We hope that this will trigger vibrant discussions in sort of each of the sessions. Before I hand over to Emiliano, who will provide you with more details on the lecture series, um, let me thank the organization team. I must say they had the idea to have the tandem of researchers in each of the sessions, and they proposed the names of those who should be invited. Many thanks for this. I would also like to thank the presenters who immediately accepted the invitation. I guess you could not resist being invited by my junior and young colleagues in the team who did all this on their own. So thanks for all of you, the inviters and the invitees. And now I hand over to Emiliano. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Thanks everyone. On behalf of the organizing committee, Caro, Joel, Giorgio, Matteo, Stan, Angela, and me, a warm welcome to everyone who's in here today and to whom, given the magic of this virtual spot, we wish good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Uh, we're very happy uh, to see that this ambitious idea we had almost uh, one year ago to gather together first-class researchers on language processing has now become uh, a concrete thing. Uh, we have been working hard uh, in the past eight months to make this virtual space become an opportunity to meet and discuss about uh, language and the future of language research. The series will officially start today and last until the end of September with some well-deserved break in August. And as you can see on the slide, uh, that includes uh, nine fantastic tandems from different universities and research directions, which we'll list here on the welcome slide. So we start today, May 19, till September 29, when um, Bing Zhang Liu and Lauren Tyler will conclude with the last tandem speed. The goal of the series is that of providing answers to the questions like, uh, what information do we combine in language? 
is this process domain specific or domain general? How does the brain support combinatorics in language? How does combination take place during language acquisition? What kind of cutting edge empirical methods will bring us further? And last but not least, how can theory influence experimental linguistics and vice versa? Our intention is that to wrap up suggestions, solutions and proposals from our invited speakers in the form of a symposium, which will take place in October 2021, 20, um, and which will be centered around four hands-on workshops on experimental approaches to language research. You can of course follow us uh, on uh, our Twitter account at Frederici Lab. You can join our newsletter and of course regularly check our website on the Max Planck platform. I can see that we are about um, more than 100 people across Zoom and YouTube at the moment, maybe more. So it's time and my absolute pleasure to welcome the first tandem of the Leipzig Lectures of Language 2021, Lin Wang and uh, Gina Kuperberg from Tufts University and the Massachusetts General Hospital, who will give a talk titled, Does Hierarchical Predictive Coding Mediate Language Comprehension? Evidence from Computational Modeling and MEG. -E I'll briefly introduce a bio about Lena and Jean, Gina Kuperberg. Lin Wang is a junior faculty researcher, uh, instructor in Massachusetts General Hospital, Harvard Medical School, working closely with a neurocognition of language lab, Department of Psychology at Tufts University of Boston. Her most recent work is focused on how humans predict upcoming um, linguistic information and the neural mechanism underlying the processing of predicted and unpredicted information. Gina Kuperberg is the then at Stiebel Professor of um, Cognitive Science, Department of Psychology, Tufts University, and a principal investigator in the Psychiatry Neuroscience Program at the Massachusetts General Hospital, Harvard Medical School. She and her lab use a multimodal neuroimaging technique, EEG, MEG, fMRI, in combination with computational modeling to understand the neurocognitive mechanisms by which the human brain builds meaning from language how these mechanisms break down in neuropsychiatric disorders, such schizophrenia. The talk uh, should have the form of a 10, 15 minutes presentation by the senior researcher and about 30 minutes talk by the junior researcher. After that, we will have space for a few questions to be asked to our invited speakers from the audience. Some info about how to participate in the talk. Please keep your microphone muted. You can post your questions anytime into the YouTube or a Zoom chat prefaced by Q. Junior researchers have priority, so please preface your questions with uh, QJ. You can also post questions on Twitter using the hashtag LeipzigLang21. Members of the committee will gather questions across the three platforms. We might have filter questioning in case many arrive. So I would say that to increase interaction, I as moderator might invite people who post their questions on Zoom to turn the mic on and post the question themselves into the speakers if the question will be selected. We are also offering live captioning, which you can enable in your personal Zoom account. And now uh, enough from my side, thank you very much from, for your attention. And now we are so happy to welcome Lin Wang and Gina Kuperberg. So Jin and Lina, the virtual stage is yours. You can share your uh, your slides, and we are thrilled to listen. Just pitch. Thank you very much. You all see my slides? Perfectly. That's great. Yeah. Thank you. So first of all, thank you so much um, to all of the organization uh, committee uh, for inviting us and what a fantastic idea for a talk series. Uh, and it's a privilege to be sharing our work with you all. Um, and so without any further ado, uh, like most of you watching out there, our lab is interested in understanding language comprehension. Um, at Mars, primarily third level, it's neurobiology, when and where the brain maps linguistic inputs onto different levels of representation to come up with some higher level representation of meaning. 
Now at Mars first level of analysis, this process can be described within the generative framework. And that's the way our lab has been thinking for many years, it can describe comprehension as a process of inference, probabilistic inference, the process by which we infer the most likely cause of the input, the posterior and base terms, by combining our prior beliefs with the likelihood of observing new inputs given these beliefs at multiple levels of representation. But it's challenging to go from MAR level one to MAR level three. And so what we need is an algorithm. We need an algorithm that bridges between them. And so over the next few slides, I'm going to be telling you um, about such an algorithm. Uh, I'm going to be telling you a bit more about predictive coding. So one thing that we've known for many years is that the brain produces an evoked phase-locked neural response between 300 to 500 milliseconds of the onset of each incoming word, even in plausible sentences. And we know that this response is highly sensitive to the predictability of each of these incoming words. And this, of course, as you all know, most of you know, is the N400, which is detectable both by ERPs and MEG at the scalp surface. The more unpredictable an incoming word, the larger, more negative going, the N400 that it produces. Now we've also known for many years that the amplitude of the N400 is sensitive to word predictability, regardless of the constraint of the prior context. And that's an important point that's sometimes lost. Um, in other words, the amplitude of the N400 is just as large to a word that's unexpected in a low constraint context, simply because it's unpredicted. Um, as of the N400 to what violates a prior prediction in the plausible sentences. So if you're predicting swimmers, as in this example, and you get trainees, then you're gonna get just as large N400 as if you hadn't predicted any word at all. Now, while there've been many studies examining the underlying neural sources of the N400, it's interesting when we looked, very few of them have actually looked at the effects of predictability in plausible sentences. And um, none of them had man manipulated constraint. But here you can see from these MEG source localization um, findings um, led by Lynn and various other people in our labs that um, the evoked response between 300 to 500 milliseconds produced by unpredicted words in plausible sentences, regardless of whether or not they violate prior constraints, localizes to multiple regions within the left lateralized temporal cortex, lateral, medial, lateral, medial, and temporal regions um, that we know mediate the retrieval of lexicosemantic features of incoming words. So a really important question is what are the underlying computations that the brain is carrying out that drive this evoked activity? And there are several computational models out there. And um, I'm just going to highlight those that have explored the sensitivity to the, of the N400 to lexicosemantic predictability during sentence comprehension. And all these models, it's assumed that successive bottom-up inputs induce some kind of change in state um, of the model or the brain. And in some of these models, such as the ones by um, Lena Roboski and by Brower, then the modeler then retroactively computes the difference between the new state induced by the new input and the previous state induced by the old input and characterizes this difference as the N400. But there's a problem with this approach and that it's somewhat unclear why the brain might actually bother to do this retroactive calculation. Now you could argue that it's some kind of epiphenomenon, but why and how does this sort of happen and produce this, this N400 that um, we can localize the temporal cortex and, and see on the uh, scalp surface. In another more recent model, the N400 was characterized as the difference between a natural prediction of the next input and the input itself. In other words, it was characterized as a prediction error. But in this model, prediction error was only used for longer term learning. It played no actual role in comprehension, the process of actually inferring the meaning of the word or sentence from the linguistic book, which again, doesn't quite kind of ally with how we think about the N400 uh, in classic frameworks of predictive language comprehension qualitative frameworks. So instead today, what I'm gonna be arguing for is a somewhat different view of the evoked response between 300 to 500 milliseconds within the temporal cortex. And one that I think maps more intuitively onto what most people have in mind when they think about predictive language comprehension. 
And that is that it corresponds to the magnitude of lexicosemantic prediction error that computers as a key step in a computational algorithm that's been proposed to approximate probabilistic inference in the brain, predictive coding. Now, I really want to emphasize this. Predictive coding has been used in many, many different ways and sometimes used very broadly in the literature, but I'm not using it here to refer to any old predictive processing the brain. I'm not even using it to refer to any old Bayesian or probabilistic inference in the brain, or even to, the, uh, to refer specifically to the computation of prediction error by the brain. What I'm using it is in a very specific sense uh, that was first described in this beautiful classic study by Rowan Ballard, and it's since, since been um, uh, generalized, um, but I'm using it in this very classic sense to refer to a particular commitment to a type of network architecture and a particular algorithm that was first described in the visual system. And as I say, that's uh, been proposed to approximate probabilistic inference. Now, one of the key distinguishing features of this architecture is that it commits not only to the presence of units that represent the state of activity at each level of representation, but to the presence of, presence of functionally distinct error units at each level. And these error units compute the difference between the observed state and the state that's actually been predicted by high level of representation prediction error. So here on the left, what I'm gonna be showing you is the prior state of the model. And on the right, I'm gonna be showing you the current state. And I'm now gonna be showing you how prediction error is computed. And so here we have a bottom-up input, but instead of this information being passed directly to the next level of the hierarchy, it's in fact passed to error units over here. Meanwhile, a higher level state is sending a top-down reconstruction to the lower level state to these error units, and that's the blue arrow that I'm showing here. And as I said, the error units are computing the difference, uh, the residual information between the observed and the reconstructed state, and that's the prediction error. And the prediction, it's the prediction error that provides the bottom-up input uh, to the next level of the hierarchy. And importantly, at this next uh, level of the hierarchy, it's used to update the old state to the new state. Meanwhile, the new state is passed to the next uh, prediction error of, of that level. Uh, sorry, to the next error units at that level. Um, meanwhile, top-down level is being reconstructed. Um, uh, top-down state units are trying to reconstruct that state. And once again, the residual difference is passed up and this continues um, right up the hierarchy. Now, as I said, in predictive coding, the generation of top-down predictions and the computation of prediction error is not there just to ensure that comprehension is fast and efficient. I mean, of course, that's a great thing about prediction, it, it does do that. But importantly, and that's something I certainly sort of really failed to realize for many years, it's, it's a necessary step for the brain to actually infer the underlying representation of the input in the first place. It's key to probabilistic inference. And to um, illustrate what I mean, I'm next gonna take you uh, through a few um, uh, iterations of the algorithm. So to begin with the model, the brain has no idea what's gonna come up next. And so any top-down reconstruction that I'm showing you here, um, is not very accurate at all. And I'm, I'm showing that with a thin blue line. And so therefore, any bottom-up input or, um, will produce a really large prediction error. And I'm depicting that here with a, a thick line. So this means that on the next iteration of the algorithm, the top-down reconstruction will be a bit more accurate. So it's slightly thicker line. And so in this way, the model, the brain, will incrementally converge on the correct state, at which point the prediction error is minimized. Now, finally, there's another computation in the algorithm, which is sometimes ignored in discussions of predictive coding, but I think it's important because it provides a way for top-down information to be propagated down the hierarchy, even in the absence of bottom-up input, and that's the computation of top-down bias. So if there's information in a top-down reconstruction that isn't actually present in the bottom-up input, or if the bottom-up input doesn't actually appear, then the error units will compute another difference, the top-down bias, which will get passed down the hierarchy 
and bias the update on the next um, iteration of the algorithm. And these state units will then produce reconstructions. And once again, this will continue until the information gets passed down. Now, there's one thing to talk about predictive coding in the abstract, and, and many of us have done it. And there's, there's beautiful work in the fMRI literature and some in the MEG literature by Matt Davis's group and others um, uh, showing quite a lot of uh, evidence for predictive coding in uh, lower level uh, perceptual um, processing of language. Um, but what I really want to highlight is people, including Lynn from our lab, uh, that have actually simulated it. Uh, and uh, this uh, effort was led by Sam Samur um, Noor Adin, who's a third year graduate student in our lab. And um, Sam implemented a predictive uh, coding model of lexicosemantic processing. And what's wonderful about this model, it's got exactly the same predictive coding architecture and algorithm as a model that's been used to uh, simulate low level visual uh, perceptual phenomena um, outside the language domain. But um, obviously the representations are different. It's got distributed semantic features. It's got lexical representations and orthographic features. And what I'm just gonna briefly show you next to set up for Lynn is three sets of simulations. So in these, the first set of simulations, Sam is first presenting a dummy contextual um, uh, layer at the top of the model with a top-down input. And that corresponds to expected information. And then he's running the model for 20 iterations, and then he's presenting the bottom-up input. And again, letting that run for 20 iterations. Um, and as these 20 inter iterations of bottom-up input are happening, what I'm gonna show you is the magnitude of the average lexical and semantic prediction error to inputs of varying um, closed probabilities varying predictabilities. Um, and um, at each inter iteration of the algorithm to produce a time course. And, and to my knowledge, there's really no other model of la language um, comprehension that can sort of produce this, this time course because it looks beautiful. You can see a time course that looks remarkably like an ERP, like an N400, with the magnitude of the prediction error first rising as the new bottom input becomes available. Um, and increases the prediction error and then falling as the top-down state units converge and shut down the prediction error. Um, and just like the N400, this uh, prediction error is depending on the predictability of the input. And just to highlight the fact that in predictive coding, at least at the lexico-semantic level, uh, the prediction error is simply the magnitude of the unpredicted input. It's not uh, inde directly indexing a prediction violation, um, you can see here that um, just like the N400 prediction errors of the same magnitude uh, to unexpected inputs that violate a prior predic uh, prediction or that are just simply unexpected. Now, and just an aside, although these are the only simulations of prediction prediction error using this model that I'm gonna show you, uh, I would like to mention that Sam's actually used it to model a lot of um, N400 findings, including low level lexical effects and priming effects. So as I keep emphasizing, the computation of prediction error in predictive coding serves a purpose. It's what actually allows this set of functionally distinct state units to iteratively converge or sharpen on the correct representation. So this time, instead of extracting the prediction error produced by the unexpected and the expected inputs, I'm about to show you the total amount of state activity that's being produced on each iteration of the algorithm as it converges or sharpens over time. And again, I'm doing this averaging across the lexico and semantic levels. And you can see that exactly as you'd expect, the expected inputs converge or sharpen faster than the unexpected inputs. Now, I want you to look at this because um, it's gonna set up one of Lynn's questions. Uh, what I'm um, plotting here, is the same simulation of the state units sharpening as I've just shown you, his uh, predicted, his unpredicted. Um, but uh, in the transparent, I'm also showing you the uh, prediction error on the same plot. Um, and if you focus here on the blue lines, you can see that um, as the uh, state units sharpen and act total activity rises, so prediction error is small. And uh, so that 
dissociation arises directly from the functional distinction between area units and state units that really characterizes the predictive coding architecture, not as far as I know any other uh, type of algorithm. And it directly motivates one of Lynn's questions. And that is whether between 300 and 500 milliseconds, it's possible to actually dissociate this decrease in evoked activity, which I've argued reflects prediction error from the increase in state activity in response to incoming words that actually confirm prior predictions. Finally, in this third simulation, we're only looking at the pre-activation phase before Sam actually gives the model new bottom-up input. And what I'm gonna show you is the total amount of pre-activated activity in the state units at each level of representation. And what I think is really striking here is that this pre-activation is largely silent. Now we know it's there. I mean, Sam gave it to the model and I've shown you all this evidence that it reduces prediction error to predicted inputs and that leads to faster convergence and state units to predictive inputs. Yet collapsed over all items, it's actually not leading to an overall rise in activity before the model actually gets the new bottom up input, which is over here. And so this, I think, motivates another question that Lynn's going to answer for you. Is it possible to actually detect evidence of this pre-activation of specific words or, or features, even when they don't induce an overall rise in activity before the bottom-up input actually becomes available? So to see what I mean, imagine that you're reading this sentence. In the crib, there was a tiny... Now, before you've actually seen the next word, it's highly likely that you'll predict the concept baby. And uh, here I'm actually showing you uh, Lynn's gorgeous new baby, Sean. She's not only an amazing researcher, she's also a new mother. And Sean is associated with all types of uh, features like kicking, crying, and of course, cute and gorgeous. Um, and these uh, features are not uh, simply represented in one particular locus of the brain. It's highly unlikely all of Sean's wonders would be predict that would be represented just in the temporal cortex or anywhere else. They're thought to be widely distributed across the, the cortex. And Lynn's gonna use spatial representational similarity analysis to find whether it's possible to actually detect this pre-activation as unique item specific spatially distributed patterns. She's also gonna show you some really interesting data uh, using temporal similarity analysis to show you evidence for hubs within the anterior and medial temporal cortex that actually may produce item specific temporal patterns of neural activity that may play a role possibly in even binding these features together to form a coherent whole and instantiate these predictions. And then she's gonna ask whether in high constraint context is possible to depict, uh, to actually detect orthographic uh, predictions, not just patterns of activity corresponding to Sean's semantic features, but also the actual orthographic uh, representation of the word baby. And then ask whether as predictive coding predicts, uh, whether the pre-activation of orthographic form occurs after the pre-activation of semantic features. Finally, a key feature of a predictive coding uh, and the model that I just showed you is that it doesn't simply predict upcoming lexical items, the whole point is that it's always trying to predict at multiple levels of representations at multiple grains. And, um, you know, this is something which is true of any generative, uh, actively generative framework of language comprehension. So if you read a context like she cautioned the, then there's no one word that um, that constrains for, but it does constrain for a set of semantic features that characterize animate but not inanimate entities. And so Lynn will use spatial RSA to ask whether it's possible to detect evidence of the pre-activation, not only of the semantic features of individual words, but whole sets of features associated with semantic categories um, like animacy, even in non-constraining contexts. And so with all these exciting questions, I'll hand over to Lynn and let her take over. Thank you. Okay, uh, let me share my screen first. Do you see it? Yes, perfect. Yeah. 
Okay. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Uh, thank you, Gina, for the great introduction. And also, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving us this opportunity to present our work. Um, uh, in this first study, I will show you how we dissociated the neural activity that reflects prediction error and that reflects state activity for words that confirm our uh, predictions. So, um, so as Gina showed earlier, uh, the predict the predict coding model proposes a functional distinction between error units and state units. Uh, the expected inputs produce minimum prediction error, but a large total amount of state activity. As you know, there has been lots of neural evidence for the reduced lexicosemantic prediction error produced by expected than unexpected input as indicated by the evoked N400 activity. However, it has been challenging to find neural evidence for increased state activity that represents the underlying representations of expected inputs. Mm, uh, this might be because that most studies have mirrored evoked responses, uh, which are thought to be primarily sensitive to prediction error. So in this MEG study, we aimed to detect the increased state activity produced by the expected words using spatial similarity analysis. Uh, we recorded MEG signals when 26 participants read high constraining sentences that ended with either expected or unexpected words. So for example, following the context in the crib, there is a sleeping, the critical word could be an expected word baby or an unexpected but still plausible word child. We are interested in the brain activity within the 300 to 500 milliseconds time window following the critical words on set. So we first uh, projected the single trail EEG, uh, MEG signal from sensor space to source space so that we can measure the uh, brain activity at each source location. In order to replicate previous findings on N400 effect, we calculated the evoked responses produced by the expected and unexpected words. We then compared their mean amplitude within the 300 to 500 milliseconds time window and tested which brain regions showed significant differences. Then in order to um, measure the increased state activity following the expected words, we carried out spatial similarity analysis within different uh, regions of interest, like ROS of the temporal, uh, left temporal cortex. This analysis captures the presence of representational information that is consistent over trials by suppressing random noise that varies across trials. Within each ROI at each time point, we extracted the spatial vector for each trial in the expected condition. We then correlated the spatial vector produced by all pairs of expected words. Just as the event-related analysis averages the amplitude across trials to reduce random noise, we averaged all the pairwise correlation values to capture the state activity as measured by the spatial pattern that is consistent across all expected trials. This resulted in a within expected correlation value, reflecting the amount of shared information encoded in the spatial pattern across all expected trials at this particular time point. Then at the same time point, we also extracted the spatial vector for each trial in the unexpected condition. And then we correlated the spatial vectors produced by all pairs of uh, expected and unexpected words. The average the between condition correlation value reflects the amount of shared information between the expected and unexpected trials. We repeated this analysis at all time points in the whole post-stimulus time window. 
this gives uh, us two time series of correlation values. One is for expected condition and the other is for the between condition. So after the state units settle on the lexical semantic representations for the expected words, the increased state activity should produce high within uh, expected correlation values. In contrast, the brain activity produced by the uh, unexpected words showing red here mainly reflects prediction error instead of the representational information within state units. This should produce low spatial similarity between the expected and unexpected trials, and thus leading to low between condition correlation values. So finally, we subtracted the between condition correlation values from the within uh, expected correlation values. This resulted in a difference time series reflecting the increase in state activity when the expected words settled on their underlying representations. We predefined the 17 uh, spatial ROIs based on the fine grained human brain natal atlas. We conducted spatial permutation tests to account for multiple comparisons across these ROIs. So indeed, the unexpected words produced a larger N400 than uh, the expected words showing here. Uh, the effect was localized to the left superior temporal and the ventral medial temporal lobe. Interestingly, although the expected words produced a smaller N400 amplitude than unexpected words, they produced the large spatial similarity values this effect was significant within the middle portion of middle temporal lobe and the middle portion of the inferior temporal lobe. Therefore, our findings provide evidence for the increase the state activity that encode the lexical semantic representations of expected words. As Gina introduced earlier, um, predictive coding also suggests that following predictable context top-down reconstruction can pre-activate the representations of upcoming input. However, the summed activity within the state units didn't show much activity prior to bottom-up input. This is also the case for lots of studies examining uh, face-locked evoked activity prior to bottom-up input. Um, Gina explained that the lack of overall rise of activity might be due to the spatially distributed activity that encode atom-specific information. It could be that the average of brain activity within each cortical location makes it difficult to deduct the spatially distributed activity that varies from atom to atom. It has been shown that a spatial representational similarity analysis can detect atom-specific spatial patterns of neural activity that comes from distributed cortical uh, sources, even when the brain activity is recorded from the stop surface. The basic assumption of uh, spatial RSA is that the representation of a unique word is associated with distinct uh, spatial patterns of neural activity. So uh, for example, the distributed representation of the word baby will produce a particular uh, spatial pattern of neural activity as a stop surface. Well, uh, another um, word, the distributed representation of rows will produce a different spatial pattern of neural activity. Therefore, the same word should produce similar pattern of neural activity, while different words should produce less similar uh, pattern of neural activity. So in this MEG study, uh, we constructed 120 pairs of high constraint sentences. Each pair of sentence contexts constrained for the same uh, sentence final word so for example here, inside the crib, there is a sleeping. 
And in the hospital, there's a newborn, both constrained for the word baby. For uh, the another pair of sentence contacts, for Valentine's Day, uh, she received a bouquet of red to show his love. He gave his uh, girlfriend three fragrance, both constrained for the word uh, roses. Therefore, the within pair sentences constrained for the same words, while the between pair sentences constrained for different words. We recorded the MEG activity uh, when 26 participants read these sentences word by word. Each word was presented for 200 milliseconds followed by 800 milliseconds blank. We analyzed the brain activity from the onset of the uh, pre-sentence final word to sentence final word in order to examine the um, brain activity in the prediction time window. We constructed, uh, we conducted the uh, spatial representational similarity analysis to the MEG data at the sensor level. So for at each trail and at each time point, we extracted a spatial vector across all MEG sensors. This spatial vector represents the spatial pattern of neural activity. Then we correlated the spatial vectors for each within pair in which the same word was predicted in the correlating trials. Then we averaged all within pair correlation values to estimate the spatial similarity for all within pair trials at this time point. We also conducted the same analysis for all between pairs in which different words were predicted in the correlating trials. This allowed us to get a baseline estimation of the uh, spatial similarity. We repeated this process at each time point separately for the within pair and between pair conditions, uh, had, like, resulting in two time series of similarity values. Finally, like before, we subtracted the between pair similarity from the within pair similarity. This resulted in a different time series reflecting the increase in spatial similarity when the predicted words had the same representations. So here I'm showing you the uh, spatial similarity effect. As you can see, immediately after the presentation of the pre-sentence final words, the spatial similarity values uh, was, were larger when the same word was predicted than when different words were predicted. This result suggests that we can detect the pre-activation of spatially distributed atom-specific representations. Then the next question is how this uh, pre-activated distributed features become bound together to instantiate atom-specific predictions. A classic hypothesis uh, proposes that the distributed semantic information become bound together to represent specific concepts through a process called temporal synchrony within the uh, convergence zones or a semantic hub, people sometimes call it. Um, therefore, we hypothesis that the prediction of a unique upcoming word can be instantiated through a unique temporal pattern of uh, brain activity. So in order to test whether and where the distributed features are bound together, where these atom-specific temporal patterns of neural activity, we conducted a temporal uh, representational similarity analysis to the MEG data in the source space. We focused on the temporal pattern of brain activity within the time window where we detect the atom-specific pre-activation that is from minus uh, 880 to minus 485 milliseconds. At each walk so, we correlated these temporal patterns for uh, each within pair in which the same word was predicted. Uh, and like before, we then averaged all these within pair correlation values to estimate the temporal similarity for all within pair trials at this walk so. We also conducted the same analysis for all between pairs in which different words were predicted. We did this analysis for all voxels in the brain 
and then calculated the difference between the within pair and the between pair uh, temporal similarity values. We then conducted a, a cluster-based permutation test to identify the brain regions that show the increased temporal similarity for the within pairs than between pairs. Um, here, we found that the temporal pattern of brain activity was more similar when the same word like within pair here were predicted comparing to when different words were predicted between pair as shown here as a difference. The difference was found with the anterior part of left inferior temporal physiform and the medial temporal lobe. These regions might serve as a semantic hub that functions to bind the distributed semantic features to give rise to atom specific pre-activation. We now know that uh, atom specific temporal patterns of brain activity instantiates the prediction of upcoming information. According to the predictive coding model, after the uh, presentation of expected input, the state units should settle on the same underlying representation as that was pre-activated prior to uh, stimulus onset. That is the same pattern of neural activity should be observed before and after bottom-up input. Therefore, we further tested whether the atom-specific temporal pattern was re-instantiated from uh, following the expected bottom-up input. So in this analysis, again, for each trail and at each voxel, we use the temporal pattern of neural activity within the 300, 500 milliseconds time window as a reference. Within the, um, then within the pre-stimulus interval that showed the pre-activation effect, we also defined three overlapping 200 milliseconds time windows from minus 900 to minus 500 milliseconds. We then correlated the temporal pattern of neural activity between this reference time window with each of the pre-stimulus time windows. So for each pre-stimulus time window, this resulted in one temporal similarity value for each trial and at each voxel. Like before, we repeated this analysis at each voxel to get the temporal similarities for all brain regions. We compared the temporal similarity values between the expected trials and unexpected trials uh, using cluster-based computation test. As you can see here, uh, within the predictive time window, we found the greater temporal similarity when bottom-up input confirmed predictions than when it uh, violated predictions. And this effect was localized to very similar brain regions uh, as before, um, like, like uh, the, for the regions that showed the atom-specific pre-activations. Uh, pre However, since the predicted words were identical, baby, baby here, it's difficult to tell at which level of representation the predictions were made. So in the next study, we tried to dissociate the pre-activation at the semantic level from that as a word form level. And we use the features of homographs, words that use, uh, have the same word form, but different uh, uh, meanings, like bank, river bank, and a financial bank. We constructed 84 triplets of high-constraint sentences. And with each triplet, the sentence contacts were predictive of either a homograph's subordinate meaning, here, for example, a river bank, or it's a uh, dominant meaning here, the financial bank, or a word that was semantically related to the dominant meaning, uh, a word here, loan. This creates two types of related pairs. The first type was a form-related homograph pair with the predicted words overlapping in form, but not meaning, bank and bank here. The second tab was a semantically related pair with the predicted words overlapping in meaning, but not in form, this financial bank and the loan. The uh, predicted words across triplets 
did not overlap either in meaning or in form. So we took them as between pairs. We recorded the EEG data when 33 participants read these sentences word by word. And each word was presented for 300 milliseconds with a 400 milliseconds blank. Then we conducted a spatial representational similarity analysis to the EEG data just before the onset of the critical words. As in the previous study, we calculated the spatial similarity time series for the uh, form-related, semantically related, and between pairs within the predictive time window. So to test the uh, meaning-based pre-activation, we calculated the difference in the spatial similarity produced by the semantically related pairs and the between pairs, shown in pink here. This analysis showed a significant uh, uh, difference around minus 400 to minus 300 milliseconds prior to the critical word onset, providing evidence for meaning-based pre-activation. Then to test the form-based pre-activation, we calculated the difference in the similarity produced by the form-related and uh, between condition uh, pairs, between pairs, shown in brown here. This analysis showed a significant difference between minus uh, 53 to minus eight milliseconds prior to the uh, bottom up input, providing uh, evidence for form-based pre-activation. Therefore, this study provided a clear neural evidence for semantic and form pre-activation during the processing of high constraining sentences. The earlier pre-activation of semantic information than form information is consistent with the hierarchical predictive coding, suggesting that the top-down pre-activation is propagated from higher to lower level of the hierarchy over time. So in all this analysis, uh, in this studies, we used a high constraining context to detect the atom specific pre-activation. The question is whether we can still detect uh, some like, categorical semantic pre-activation, even when the context do not constrain strongly for a specific word. Uh, in natural language use, context that pre the specific words appear relatively uh, infrequently. However, comprehenders can still use the contextual constraints to predict some aspects of upcoming uh, input. So for example, following the context that like Gina mentioned earlier, they cautioned the, we might predict the next word to be uh, swimmers or uh, trainees or some other animated nouns. Similarly, following another context, like she invited her, we might predict the word to be friends, colleagues, or some other enemy nouns. But then following some other context, like she unfolded the, uh, or he drank the, we will predict that the following words should be in enemy nouns. It has been shown that animated entities share more co-occurring semantic features uh, when, which are strongly intercorrelated compared to e entities. So for example, the anime words like swimmers, trainees, share more co-occurring uh, semantic features like they can move, they have legs, or they can breathe. Uh, while the inanimate words like paper or water, they have more distinct features like thin for paper or drinkable for water. We first use the uh, word net to quantify the semantic similarity structure of the animate and inanimate nouns. So word net is an English lexical uh, database that organizes words into the hierarchy, uh, hierarchies based on their semantic uh, relations. We used a path-based approach called U Paramath semantic similarity to measure the semantic similarity between every two predicted nouns. This matrix shows the pairwise similarity, uh, semantic similarity for all animate and inanimate nouns. So here, the greater sem uh, semantic similarity is shown with a warmer color, and the lower semantic similarity values are showing cooler color. So as you can see, the enemy nouns are more semantically related to each other than the inanimate nouns. 
As mentioned earlier, the semantic features are thought to be represented with a widely, within a widely uh, distributed cortical network. Also, the distributed semantic representation is associated with a spatial pattern of neural activity measured as a scalp surface. Therefore, comparing to the inanimate concepts, the greater semantic similarity among the animate concepts should uh, produce greater spatial similarity uh, when the, these animate semantic features are pre-activated. So we recorded both MEG and EEG data when participants write uh, 200 discourse uh, contacts with, uh, with the verbs in the last sentence of the discourse constraining for animate or inanimate nouns. We then calculated the spatial similarity values at all time points following these uh, verbs, but before the nouns. Just as expected, we found a higher spatial similarity uh, values for animate constraining verbs as showing red here, than inanimate constraining verbs like as showing this cyan color. And this effect was found prior to the upcoming nouns in both the MEG and the EEG data. Therefore, this study provides neural evidence for the pre-activation of animacy linked whole semantic categories, even when the contexts do not constrain for a specific word. So uh, to summarize in this talk, we have linked the evoked N400 to lexical semantic prediction error, which can be localized to left superior and the medial temporal cortex between 300 and 500 milliseconds. We have also provided neural evidence for a functional dissociation of prediction error and the state activity. So using the spatial similarity analysis, we showed a rise in representational activity uh, to expected inputs between 300 and 500 milliseconds, even when the uh, evoked response is minimum. We also provided neural evidence for pre-activation at different levels of representation. We showed atom-specific pre-activation at the semantic and word form levels in high constraining context. In the end, we also show that the pre-activation of the whole semantic category in less constraining contexts. Okay, that's it. Uh, we would like to thank the whole lab for their support and thank you all for your attention. Uh, I will stop sharing my screen. <laughs> all right, wow, fantastic. Fantastic talk, Gina and Lynn. Thank you very much. You are perfectly in time, but there was the this interesting thing. I think uh, you showed fantastic data. We've got, we're beginning to collect some questions. And I think there is uh, plenty of room for uh, questions either on Zoom or on YouTube. And um, maybe we can start with a um, couple of questions we got from the Zoom participants. And uh, we have a question from, um, um, Stefan Tseng, if I pr pronounce it correctly, you can also, you can put your microphone on and ask the question directly, or I read it for you. So that we can increase interaction in the, in the Zoom meeting. So Stefan Tseng, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, 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 sure. Yes, uh, we can hear you. Oh, yes, cool. So my question is like, um, the, well, first, thank you for the fantastic talk. It's really interesting. And also like, uh, I really, uh, I'm really like impressed by the, by your results that like semantic, like there's a higher kind of uh, uh, similar, uh, similarity in the, in the activations between the same word, same uh, expected word and the different expected words. But did you guys control the semantic similarity of the one last words in the same expected words condition and uh, in the different expected word conditions? Because this would also result in the same similar result that you guys have demonstrated. Uh, maybe I can address this question. Uh, yes, okay. that's a great question. Yes, when we submitted the paper, of course, the first question is like, whether what about the n minus one word? Whether they already show high similarity for the within pairs and the between pairs? 
So actually, yeah. yes, we first we did some like a test to see to look at the pairwise uh, similarity for the within pairs and between pairs uh, for the n minus one word, and we didn't see any difference. And also, we run some even more uh, like well controlled <laughs> analysis. So as you in these studies, we have lots of sentences, and in some sentences, the between pairs have identical uh, n minus one word. It's like the like. Uh, I cannot think about a good, a good example, but you can imagine like the n minus one word are the same for the between pairs. So you, if it's driven by the uh, similarity for the n minus one word, then you should see high similarity for this between pairs because they have identical uh, lexicals, they are identical words. So we yes. just did the analysis for this subset of sentences where they have the identical n minus one word, but they predict different words. And then we compare this with uh, the pairs that predict the same words, but with different n minus one words. So it's very interesting that we still saw a very clear higher similarity for the within pairs that have different n minus one words than the with the, uh, then the between pairs that have the same n minus one words. So we think that this is the strongest evidence for this pre-activation instead of the processing of the n minus one word itself. Well, thank you. This is very beautiful, very beautiful result. Thank you. Oh, thank you, thank you, yeah. Great, thanks, Stefan. Maybe, uh, so we got other ad additional questions. Um, another question from a junior researcher, Hiroyoshi Yamasaki. You can turn your mic on if you want and ask your question directly here in Zoom. Uh, okay, um, thank, thank you very much for the talk. Um, I, I would just like to know a little bit more about the exact, uh, exact procedure of this prediction generation. So I'm, I wasn't quite sure how the predictions were generated in this model uh, to, to Dr. Cooperberg. Uh, I think Gina, your mic is off. Yeah. Exactly. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Um, so basically, uh, the model, as I said, uh, has a dummy contextual layer. Um, and so uh, you can, instead of uh, basically presenting bottom up input to the model, you can present um, top down um, input to the model. And what Sam did was that he provided the input. Um, in proportion to the expected close probability of a word. So for example, if you're expecting um, a, uh, if you're strongly expecting a particular word, then he'd provide that with say 99% probability and, and spread the 1% um, probability over all the rest of the lexical items. Um, but if uh, you're expecting uh, say the equivalent of a say 2% close probability, then you'd give that 2% and then uh, spread the probability all or the activation over all the others, and then let the model run for 20 iterations. Um, but you can play around with that, you know, you can sort of play around with your SOA, but basically the default was to let the model run for 20 iterations, then um, clamp and, you know, present the bottom up input. Um, and then, as I say, uh, basically extract whatever dependent measure you want from the model and plot that over each iteration of the algorithm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Great, thanks, Gina. Um, thanks, Hiroyoshi. We have a um, further question from Matt Davis. Matt, you can ask your question live if you wish. You're in Zoom, please. Thank you. Um, Gina, Lynn, that was absolutely fantastic. Really enjoyed that presentation. Um, I, I have lots of questions I could ask. I'm going to focus on asking about the bit that I didn't understand rather than uh, all of your wonderful evidence for predictions at the level of semantics and form. So in your first study that you presented, uh, you, you explored the similarity of the representation of uh, a set of different expected sentences, as I understand it. And how does the representation of all of those expected sentences differ from representations for lots of different sentences with unexpected words? Um, I wonder if you can explain a bit more about what kind of representation that's picking up. Um, I th I th um, Lynn presented it, so maybe I, I can ask Lynn for her interpretation first. 
Okay, yeah, I, I will first say something maybe Gina can add it. Uh, yeah, so here, so as shown in the model, for the common thing for all the expected words is that they all settled on their underlying representations in the end. So we think this uh, similarity we capture between all the expected words should reflect the settled underlying representations. Um, but that's our interpretation. So do you have other like uh, speculations except this? <laughs> So um, I, I, I'm not sure that I agree with that interpretation because the settled representation will be a representation of the meaning of the sentence as a whole. Um, what I guess in um, Milan Rabovsky's model would be a sentence gestalt representation. Um, and so I would have expected those to be dissimilar for different sentences. So one sentence that means something different to another would have a, a, a different sentence gestalt. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, you can go, yeah. Unless you want to go, Lynn. No, no, you can go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, so, the th yeah, we thought, we've thought a lot about this, obviously, and it's a fantastic question, Matt. Um, I think the key thing is in the, uh, Malina, say, Melina's model, basically everything's one great big mush, right? And so the assumption is there aren't levels of representations, at least at the level of meaning. I think our assumptions, and that's largely driven by the neural data um, that um, I showed and also Lynn um, showed too, where we know that for plausible sentences between 300 and 500 milliseconds, activity is actually primarily within areas um, uh, that mediate lexicosemantic processing, not necessarily frontal regions. Um, they may be, I mean, let's, I mean, there's a subtle difference because we're not saying there's no activity in the frontal cortex within this time window, but the moving activity, the activity that you're getting with the time course, and don't forget Melina's model had no sense of time though. They're, they're not looking over sort of iterations of the algorithm, but you know what you, so what we're, what we think that you're settling on um, is actually the meaning for this particular model was, is the meaning of the word given the context. Um, and perhaps that's even more striking in our model because of course our, our context was a dummy, was you know a dummy variable. Now you could argue that the brain is settling on something different, but I doubted it within the temporal cortex. Um, in other words, I think it's probably the combination of temporal and other regions that are representing the um, basically the, the the center, you know, the level of the sentence as a whole, and the thing is that the you can see the N four hundred is going up and down with the N four within the temporal cortex within that particular three hundred to five hundred milliseconds following the presentation of the incoming word, whereas within that very short time window, um, then you're basically settling on um, uh, the the state. What I thought you were getting at actually was whether, you know, the item specificity of this. Um, mm. And we thought a lot about that. And uh, I don't know whether we've got time to go into it all, but I guess uh, first of all, you know, we were we were really grappling with this because, you know, as Lynn, Lynn's beautiful data showed, previously we've, um, we've used representational similarity analysis primarily to index item specific activity. In other words, whether one word or one group of word is different for another. Here we're using it to look at the difference between expected and unexpected words within a particular time window. Um, mm -hmm. But it's, it's actually something you said um, to, uh, you know, when we went out to dinner years ago in neurobiology, you said, our spatial RSA is all about information. And, and so to the degree that you're settling on a semantic, lexico-semantic representation as it's becoming available and decoded, um, and to the great degree that, as Lynn nicely put it, you're kind of extracting out the noise, then, sorry, um, you're, you're filtering out the noise by averaging over many items. To the degree that representation is present and um, to the expected words, and when it becomes available, unlike the evoked response where you're looking at the amplitude, the change in activity, here you're basically looking at whether the information is present um, in the expected, uh, to the expected items. 
Now, the information is also present to the unexpected items, but that's going to happen a little later. Uh, and that was the nice thing about the model. Uh, you know, we could actually sort of, yeah, that was also a comforting thing because I was sort of saying to Lynn, you know, and to Sam, can we make the model basically, you know, if, it, if it's item specific, then why, would, why wouldn't we see this rise? But then Sam basically, you know, when he looked at the total amount of semantic activity as it became available to the bottom up input, it was really comforting to see that rise um, to the expected items uh, in an item non-specific way. It's, it's a really nice result, that opposition of the semantic state and the prediction error response. Thank you both, it's really interesting work. Great, thanks Matt for posing the question. Thanks. Janelin for answering. We have now two questions from YouTube, and I think that's really great because uh, with people from different platforms um, working together and uh, I'm what- I'm having trouble hearing you. Sorry? <laughs> Siri. <laughs> what happened? Siri oh, that, That's hilarious. Yeah, Siri was sorry. saying that she was having <laughs> trouble hearing you, but I'll shut her up. We have two questions actually on YouTube, and I think they are mostly quite related. I'll start with the first one from um, Dustin Chacon, if I pronounce it correctly, New York University, Abu Dhabi. And he asks, well, regarding the difference between early commitments to meaning versus later commitments to form, uh, do you have expectations for when morpho, in brackets, syntactic predictions might occur? Of course, we have been talking about semantics all the time. And the second question is also related to that one. If you want, you can answer first and then I go to the second one. So please. And I hope uh, to have read the question in the right, in the right way. So maybe yeah. I can yeah. say yeah. a little bit about the timing for the pre-activation of semantic and work form uh, information and later Gina can add on uh, some other insights and also for the syntactic part. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I know the syntactic part is a bit diff difficult because we, we didn't really model it or do much work about it. Uh, yeah, but for the uh, semantic pre-activation versus word form activation. Um, so it's very interesting when we use, the, we, we, as you know, we use the some like very slow presenta uh, presentation rate to encourage people to make uh, predictions. And then what, in all these studies, we found the pre-activation of the semantic features immediately after the uh, N-1 word is available. Meaning after you process the uh, previous word, you can generate predictions like at semantic level at least, and then immediately we can detect this. And then because we use a kind of law SOA, and then the semantic pre-activation effect kind of goes down. And then it, uh, uh, it was silent for a bit. Uh, well, maybe I, should, I could share my screen for this uh, uh, result. So you know what I'm talking about. Sure. Um, yeah. Let me find the slides first. Well, applauding, I can also add actually the, the other question we got because it's actually going in the same direction. So that's Phil Kunke, a junior researcher, who's asking, okay, you provide evidence for pre-activation of semantic and orthographic representations. What about the intermediate lexical level? So mm -hmm. what do lexical yeah. representation if distinct from semantic uh, and form? So the two questions go actually pretty well hand hand. So please, Lynn, thank you. Yeah, so yeah, I was talking about the effect here, the semantic uh, pre-actuation, as you can see, it was pre-activated much earlier, like immediately after you extract the information uh, from the N minus one word, then the semantic uh, pre-activation is detectable, and then it goes down for a while, well, yeah, just disappeared, and then the uh, word form information uh, is the pre-activation is detected. So we think there are a few uh, explanations. So there are lots of uh, literature in the working memory uh, field. They think that the maintenance, maintenance of, this, of the information may not be really like a, a copy that is persistent neural firing. So the information could be 
uh, maintained in the activity silent uh, way. So we think that this earlier activation of the semantic uh, information could be just that uh, it was detected immediately after the predict, uh, prediction is made, and then it uh, goes down because you don't need to uh, maintain it all the time. And then for the uh, word form activation, it was only detectable immediately before the upcoming input. So it's also very interesting, like uh, if we, you, you could imagine why it's not immediately after the semantic information is activated, why it's here. So we think also just uh, borrowed from the uh, working memory literature. So they have shown that information can be decoded, de decoded again immediately before the uh, information is relevant again. So as you can imagine, uh, just before the upcoming word is presented, you will say, oh, ha, ha. The, you, you will do this bottom up, this visual uh, analysis of this upcoming word. So just because before it comes, this visual information becomes relevant, and then you can reactivate it again. So we, see, we saw some gap here. We think this gap is not really uh, reflecting, okay, there must be like 300 milliseconds between the pre-activation of the semantic information and the pre-activation of the word form information. We think this match relates to this uh, decodability of the maintained information, uh, like when when they are decodable or not. So if we use uh, like a um, like shorter SOA, for example, if we kind of shrink this interval a little bit, we might see the pre-activation of the word form uh, features a little bit earlier. So we don't think this is like a, this fixed, uh, like a 300 milliseconds interval between form, uh, form and semantic pre-activation is just because there's a 300 milliseconds between them. Uh, and then I think also people ask, yeah, how about this lexical uh, part? Um, so in this study we use, you know, we, as Gina, yeah, Gina has always been like, we have been talking about, yes, what about this lexical layer? So at least in this study, this lexical uh, layer is kind of like, like mapping function that links the semantic features uh, with the word form features. So actually, I'm not sure, like it, it's, we think this mapping function could be the same for different words, right, for, or for the, word form or semantic or between pairs, they should be the same. So in our paradigm, by comparing the different pairs, because this mapping function is the same for all the different words. So we, I don't think it's, uh, we, we could really detect this, but yeah, but I don't know if there is a good way to show that. Maybe Gina can say something about it. Yeah, no, I think that this particular paradigm, because we use homographs, there is actually no, there is no unique mapping. Uh, so if we were going to detect it, we're not going to detect it in this paradigm, because there is no unique mapping between the orthography and, um, and the meaning for any of the within pairs that we looked at. However, you could potentially look at it for um, the first paradigm that Lynn showed where you've got the identical pairs. Um, and um, there we, but there we won't be able to dissociate form and meaning. So we actually do have like a, a grant that we've written where we hopefully will be able to uh, disentangle those things. But simply because of, you know, the I mean, it was cool that we were able to use homographs to disentangle meaning and form uh, because you can't do that easily in English. Um, but, um, but that came at the expense of using the identical words where the whole point is that you can't disentangle those. So we, we don't know whether uh, there were item specific uh, patterns that were unique to any one mapping between form and meaning. And I really think of that. The, I mean, I hate the word lexical because it means so many different things to different people. But to me, it's simply a mapping between a unique form and a unique meaning. I absolutely like the idea of thinking of lexicon as a mapping function between form and meaning. So we could really take this out from, a, from this answer. 
the idea that lexicon is just a mapping function between two different dimensions and there's actually no way to ask about lexicon. And syntax, uh, if you, I mean, depending on your model. Absolutely. Aspects well, of syntax. Yeah. Uh, I hope you uh, have time for uh, one question and two general ones before we close the uh, the talk. We have an additional question from YouTube, which are a more general one from um, from Carla McGregor, where she asks, are, are comprehension and learning one and the same thing in the model? That's a great question. I, I guess I'll address that um, because, yeah, we've thought a lot about that. In our model, it's not a learning model. So it, it's, you know, predictive coding was described by Rao and Ballard purely as doing inference. And um, in our model, we basically gave the model its weights. We didn't train it uh, sort of similar to the sort of old interactive activation models. We're assuming particular mappings and we're using those mappings to do inference. Um, but um, the more general question, um, I think, you know, about the relationship between learning and inference is a really important one. And, um, and so while our model didn't do it, it's possible that the, it, it's perfectly possible to make a model that does. In fact, um, I was discussing with Sam the other day, you know, that there are very few predictive coding models out there, actually algorithms, instantiated models that do both a learning and inference. But there's a beautiful paper by, by Rao, you know, like I think it's 1997 or 1999 after the Nature Neuroscience one, where um, they basically showed obviously with a very simple linear system um, that the same prediction error could be used sort of to train the model. The big difference between prediction error and predictive coding and its use in learning versus inference is time scale. And that's true in any Bayesian framework. So in a Bayesian framework, you know, the difference between the prior and the posterior, which is in Bayes, I guess, a more post hoc thing as opposed to what I told you about predictive coding where it's more proactive, but the difference, you know, can be thought of as a, as a prediction error. And, um, and you, and, and you know, there's beautiful models by Dave Kleinschmidt and Florian Yeager, where basically you can show that, that, that learning is inference, that if you're doing basically inference over a long time, uh, longer time scale over the weights themselves, then that is a way of training and instantiating model. And of course, all these classic models do, uh, I mean, even classic connectionist models do, um, uh, learning through uh, prediction error. So you can sort of imagine that the same prediction error that's being used to do inference in our model could in theory be used to train, to do learning and inference in parallel, um, but the learning would happen over a longer time scale and it would be much harder to implement. But I certainly think that most modern theories of um, of uh, language processing, uh, see those two things as happening in parallel. Uh, you know, it's not only that you're comprehending, you're always learning. And I think the idea that, you know, we're using prediction error during learning and inference is uh, a really important thing. I just wanna add one more thing to that though, because I think the kind of learning that you would have to do with a prediction error as measured like by something like the N400 would be really inefficient. It would be really, really slow. Um, and so often we need to sort of adapt much, much more quickly. And there, I think you're probably using a different kind of prediction error, one that's produced at a higher level of the hierarchy. And, um, and we've shown may map onto uh, prefrontal activity, but you'll have to invite us back to talk about that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Gina. Uh, excellent answer. Um, I guess we going through uh, the end of the talk, we have now two if there are no more, other qu more questions, I would like to, um, we would like, well, as an um, organizing committee, ask two questions, one to the senior and one to the junior. I'm sorry, you're the first one answering the questions, so the other ones will be more trained, but <laughs> the first question is to the senior, and it's very simple. So what do you think um, is the most, um, important, the most important challenge for the field in the next five years? theory. <laughs> um, I, you know, I mean, Lynn is a perfect example of someone who is doing really, really sophisticated um, sort of work using all these wonderful techniques and using them together. 
And um, although she didn't talk about it, she's using sort of NLP stuff. She's looking at more naturalistic processing. Um, people in my lab are, you know, I mean, there's an explosion of the kind of tools that we have, not only our neuroimaging tools, but also our, um, you know, the computational models that can do really clever things, give you excellent estimates of predictability in every single word in a sentence, et cetera, et cetera. Um, to my mind, that offers an amazing opportunity, but it, to my mind, it also offers it also means there's a danger and there's a danger of just throwing out, throwing all these kind of fancy methods and expecting it to reveal something magical about the brain. And I really think that they should be used very wisely and that we should think, I, you know, think very clearly and in a very, I'm old fashioned in that way, in a very hypothesis driven manner about ex the questions that we want to test because it's, you know, and, and it's great. We've got these tools to be able to address them. But I do think there's a challenge in the field that people are kind of losing sight of a, a more theory driven approach. And so I would love to see the field just take a step, go a bit slower and take a step and, and really try and articulate some of the questions before answering them with these amazing methods that we've got. Wow, that was quite, quite an answer. Thank you. Thank you, Gina. Thank you. And uh, I think um, you somehow already foresee the question for, for Lynn. The question is then how can junior researchers contribute to solve to solving this challenge? So it's theory, it's methods, it's both more democratically thinking. What do you think, Lynn? Oh, for them. <laughs> yeah, so actually, yeah, when I first came to Gina's lab, before I came to, to her lab, I was also like just want to try all these fancy methods, you know, this oscillations or this connectivity, all this fancy stuff. But then after I came to Gina's lab, I thought, <laughs> oh yeah, she, she, no, no, she's such a deep thinker. Like, uh, yeah, what do you mean? Like, uh, what does this evoke response? Even just by looking at the info handle, what does it mean? And also what is this, how does this face related uh, face locked versus non face locked activity. What do they tell us? What different information do they tell us? And then we get this RSA stuff. And then what's the difference between this, you know, the patterns of, uh, of data versus the traditional, like uh, mean amplitude of the data? Like, uh, like what kind of information, what additional information these different uh, methods pro add, uh, provide us with? So, yeah, so Gina has been really like guiding me on this, like uh, to, to think more deeply, like also theoretically, like, uh, okay, yeah, language prediction. And uh, yeah, what do we mean prediction? And how does this prediction relates to like uh, learning or even later decision making all these different fields, everything's connected. So I think, so we should read more to, to go to, to not just the, like focus on our own little field, we, we, we need to read more other related fields, literature to integrate. There are lots of things that has been studied in other fields, we just don't know. So I think for, for me, uh, yes, method is definitely important because as you see, this RC helps us to decode the pre-activity information. We couldn't do this without uh, this method. But on the other hand, we also need to be really to get a better understanding of why this method is helpful and what methods are helpful for addressing what questions and also try to get a bigger picture of not, not just, a, just a focus on this little field. As you see, this predictive coding is not only in the language, it's, every, it's kind of everywhere. We need to kind of um, learn from what they got from other fields and maybe we can borrow some ideas and try to get all uh, understanding of language processing. That's, yeah, that's what I, I was thinking. I, I just want to add one thing because, you know, one, I mean, yeah, Lynn and I have the Mutual Admiration Society. I mean, it's just a, such a privilege to work with her because I, you know, I sort of put something out there and then the next thing I've got is this like, you know, we're engaging these really deep discussions. So she's paying me back. When she first came, I was sort of saying, yeah, but what does this mean? Now she does the same to me. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, slowing down and, and reading a lot, I think is, is really important. 
Thank you. Thank you, Gina. Thank you, Lina. I think there is a nice trailer for next year's conference to move around language to include additional um, site fields that might uh, help us with a better understanding of the impl implementation problem of language processing. Um, I was also, and we're all very happy to see two women in science working so nicely together. Yeah. And um, that's a true uh, happy thing that we're seeing here. And uh, we try to make this as, uh, as impacting as possible to have uh, many women. And uh, we are so happy and impressed that these women are bringing like science forward. Thank you. So, Can I say uh, one more thing, actually? Yeah, please, Gina. Because I, I don't want to stereotype oh, things about women, but I do want to say this, and I, I guess COVID has really brought this to the forefront of my mind, um, and that is science is a, really a collaborative um, enterprise, and it's something that relies on support and mutual support and boosting each other up. And, you know, there's something about kind of Twitter feeds and and kind of knee-jerk reactions and wanting to bring people down that sort of disturbed me. Um, and so I guess, you know, since I'm, I've got this forum, I, I want to say that, you know, even if you disagree with someone about an idea, there's usually something in it. And it's not a matter of one idea being right and one idea being wrong. There's usually many shades of gray and we can learn from each other from very different fields and also very different perspectives in language. And I really think that it's our job not to be, you know, kind of attacking one another about some little data point, but really from learning from each other and having more discussions like you're encouraging here. And so, you know, that's really true. We've been isolated from each other for a, for a long time now. And I really hope that we all come out of this pandemic more willing to kind of give, listen, and be more mutually supportive of one another, both in reviews as well as in discourse and things like that. So I, I guess, you know, I, I just wanted to say that. And these are good words and uh, we absolutely agree. And that's what, that was the real, the main reason why we tried to pick up this new idea of making a virtual conference, reaching people across the globe in one hour in time. And um, okay. Thank you. Thank you for the great talk. Thank you for the great answers. Thank both of you for joining. Um, we had a peak of probably around 150, uh, reading 150 to 200 people following us and watching, watching the, the video. I will just announce next week, we'll have on uh, May 26th, again, 1 p.m. UTC, so 3 p.m. here in, uh, in Leipzig. We have Jixin Lee and John Hale. New York, Abu Dhabi, and uh, University of Georgia. It's going to be another quite cool, interesting talk. And with this announcement, um, I thank you, Lynn and Gina. I thank the audience on uh, Zoom, YouTube, and Twitter. And I wish you a nice morning, nice evening, or nice afternoon. And hopefully, we're going to see each other face to face at some point very much soon. That will be a good chance. Thank you very much. And uh, big applause to Jean and Lina. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Right. Screen is stopped.